Turn to the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 3. We covered the first part last week. I'm going to do a little bit of review, but it, really you won't catch up unless you listen to last week. Uh, you know, covenant is a binding contract between two parties. Uh, it's ancient in nature. God and, and Jesus made a covenant in the same day God, Jesus and Abraham made a covenant, tying us all together. In fact, if we go back and look at Genesis chapter 15 um, and uh, verse um, 9, I think. Yeah, Genesis chapter uh, 15 and verse 9. And he said unto him, Take you a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He took unto him these parts and divided them in the midst and laid each part one against the other. But the birds he did not. And so in a covenant, they cut an animal the long way, uh, split them in two, and then they walk in a figure eight between the pieces signifying the sign of infinity, sideways eight, that were one forever, right? So Abraham's preparing this covenant. It says, when the fowls came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a whore of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, know of an assurity that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, speaking of Egypt, and shall serve them, and they shall uh, be afflicted for 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve, I will judge afterwards, they shall come out with a great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It came to pass when the sun was going down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace, God the Father, in a burning lamp, Jesus Christ, passed between the pieces. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, unto thy seed shall be. And so we see here, you know, that they did this ritual, uh, which has lots and lots of meaning. And so let's go through what the nine seals are. We did it last week. I'll go through them again this week and uh, try and bring more light to them. The first thing we do is we would exchange garments. So say two nations were making covenant. And so their kings uh, would assemble with all of the elders of the land, military leaders, and, and two groups, and there'd be two covenant makers or advocates that would come together. They would come representing their nation. And so they would do these nine things symbolic of what the agreement would entail on the two nations. So these were done physically, but the, they have spiritual connotations in what we're talking about today. So they would exchange garments. So the prince of one country would take his garment off and give it to the prince of the other country. And so they would exchange positions. So now our families would now tr actually trade royalties. And a lot of times there'd be a marriage between a princess of one nation and a prince of another. So it would be bound not only with a garment, but with marriage. And so they would exchange garments. Now, with us, as we discussed last week, you know, God the Father and Jesus uh, exchanged with each other. But when it came to Jesus making a covenant with Abraham, what he did was he took Abraham's unrighteousness and gave Abraham his righteous princely garb and gave it to him. This is symbolic that after the, the, after the covenant that we're talking about today was executed by Jesus, we become a royal priesthood. We become kings, and we rule and reign as kings. The Bible says that we're kings. Why are we kings? Why are we sons of God, a son of the king, right? Why are we a son? Why are we a prince? Why are we a royal priesthood? How do we gain royalty? Well, because... In the agreement that God made with Jesus and Jesus made with man, Jesus took our unrighteousness, which was our garment, and we took his righteousness. And so we became righteous through faith. Abraham, it was accounted to him through faith. 
So we get this exchange because God promised to Jesus, if you fulfill this gospel plan, then these promises will come to you. Jesus said if I, to Abraham if I, and all of humanity, if I fulfill this plan, all that God has given me, I'm going to give to you, the church. So the next thing we do is we'd exchange a weapon. We take a sword. We take a, a, a knife, a bow and an arrow. And really that's saying that I agree to protect you unto death. And I, I agree that we would come with you into battle, whether it be offense or defense. You can count on us dying for your nation. The third thing we do is we'd exchange. And, and what is that? That's the armor of God, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, right? Take on the breastplate of righteousness, gird you know, our, 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 our bodies, uh, you know, shot our feet, right? The shield of faith. So we have all of the spiritual armor because of covenant. We ex exchange a name, which is a type of power of attorney. So y you can now transact, the king of that nation can transact, in not only in my nation, but around the world in my name. And we could do the same. So we can use it for credit. You know, if, if one nation needed uh, cocoa uh, and neither nation uh, uh, grew it, but the king that I'm in covenant with had a relationship with a nation that had or grow, grow, you know, cocoa, I could use his name to purchase that. That's very strong. You didn't do this because death was the alternative to breaking the covenant. Well, when we go to prayer, we pray in the name of Jesus. That's a covenant promise. God listens to our prayers because, you know, Jesus said in John 16, in that day you'll ask me nothing. You'll ask the Father in my name and he'll do it for you. And, and so basically that's covenant. It's, it's, it's a contract. God bound to Jesus that he would listen to his prayers. Jesus gave that to us. So God listening to our prayers is like God listening to Jesus and his prayers. Uh, there'd be a killing or a sacrifice. Uh, you know, they lay uh, the animal one to another. In our covenant, uh, Jesus was the sacrifice. His blood was shed for the sacrifice. Uh, uh, the second, uh, fifth thing we do is we cut our hands or our wrist and we shake hands so that my bloodline now mixes with your blood. So not only this generation, but all the next generations are part of this covenant. I didn't talk about this last week. I sort of missed it, but we'd make a scar. We put ashes to make a scar. Now, when uh, Livingstone and Stanley went into Africa, the tribes in Africa were living by covenant. So when they made a covenant with a nation, they would show them a scar representing that nation on their wrist or arm. And that would, that would tell that tribe, if you mess with this guy, you're messing with the tribes behind me. Uh, th that's, the, that's the exchange of a weapon. And so uh, uh, it, uh, a scar was signatory of that. Well, Jesus will be the only human being in heaven with scars. Uh, he will have the, the, the imprints. Resurrected Jesus said, Thomas, put your hand in my side. Touch my hands. <clears throat> you and I won't have any blemishes. He'll have a scar. Uh, we would state the terms of the covenant. The entire New Testament are the terms of our covenant. We'd have a covenant meal. Our, our meal is what? Communion. You know, and so we build a memorial, and that would be what? A cross. You know, and so... We do these nine things, and in these things, we'd be swearing one to another uh, all the way through to a death sentence, you know, that, that uh, would be upon both of us to execute the terms of the covenant. So in our covenant, we have the name of Jesus. We have the weapons of our warfare. We have the garment of righteousness. We have communion. We have a memorial. He's the Lord, our healer, the Lord, our provider, the Lord, our deliverer. He's the Lord, our Savior. You know, so when you read the Bible, if you, know, if you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, let me open there in Ephesians chapter 1 real quick. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. I'll show you covenant terminology. So in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, And blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, 
blessed us with every spiritual blessing and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, circle the word in. That's a covenant terminology. In him, through him, with him, by him. Those are tying us to the agreement. We read over the words all the time. So, you know, we are what? all of, Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places we have in Christ Jesus. Every one. It says, just as he has chosen us in him, in him. How are we in him? We're in him because of covenant. Before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy, holy and blameless without love, having predestinated us to be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ. Why are you and I a son of God? We're a son of God because of covenant, right? And so it lives on. I want to I want to show you a story uh, back in in Samuel, um, back in the book of Samuel about Jonathan and David. So when Jonathan is uh, Saul's son, he's the king's son. He's the prince. He's the heir to the throne. Verse eight, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel 18, it says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan, the prince, the next king of Israel, was knit together with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own. Jonathan took off his robe and gave it to him, David, and his armor, even his sword and his uh, bow and his belt. And so David went out from wherever Saul sent him, behaving wisely. And so we see that the prince of Israel, the next king of Israel, Saul becomes demonized and wants to kill David. And so now Jonathan and David are in covenant. They swore blood one to another. They went through these nine signs and seals. You know, so they cut themselves, they shook hands, they made a scar, they exchanged a weapon, they exchanged a robe. So David's robe was that of a pulper, right? You know, he was, he was you know, he was on the, uh, essentially, he was the prince because of marriage, but, but Saul was trying to kill him. And, and so Jonathan was the next prince, the uh, next king of Israel. And so they exchanged. David had everything to gain and nothing to lose. And, and Jonathan had everything to lose and nothing to gain, very similar to Jesus. You know, so in chapter 19, uh, we see that Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all the servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan's son delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, my father seeks to kill you. He's going against, for covenant, he's going against his father and king for somebody that he swore his life to. So I don't have time to go through all of the interactions between them. Um, uh, 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 Jonathan and David, maybe I'll read one more and then we'll get to the, to the real uh, punch that I wanted you to see today. So in, in, in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, it says, If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked permission for me that he might run over to Bethlehem City, for there's a yearly sacrifice there for his family. And if he says it as well, your servant will be safe. But if he's very angry, be sure evil is determined. So Jonathan, David wants to go see his family and do an annual sacrifice. Jonathan's saying, I'll let you know what's going on. So verse 8, Therefore you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have uh, brought your servant into covenant of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, is, is there any iniquity in me? Kill me yourself. Why should you bring me uh, to your father? This is David speaking. But Jonathan said, far, Be it far from you, for I knew uh, uh, certainly that evil was determined upon my father to come upon you when I would not tell you. Would I not tell you? And so, uh, you know, uh, Saul, Jonathan sees the evil in his father's heart and his mind to want to kill David, but he knows God's on David's side. He goes on to say, Then David said to Jonathan, Who will, you, who will tell me, or what will your father answer me roughly? 
Jonathan said to David, come, let us go out in the field. Both uh, of them went out in the field. Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is a witness. When I sounded out my father's uh, sometime tomorrow or the third day, indeed, there is good toward David, then I will not send to you, I will tell you. And may the Lord do so much unto Jonathan. So here he's telling him, listen, I'll tell you what my father's going to do. Let's jump down to verse 14. You shall not only show me kindness of the Lord while I still am alive, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house or my offspring. Jonathan speaking. No, not when the Lord has cut off the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Jonathan saying to him, listen, we're in covenant. I want to remind you, I know my father's going to die and I, might, I may die with him. And they do, both died together actually in the same day. He tells him, don't cut off covenant from my father. Don't cut it from my father's house, from my house. I, you know, I have children, I have a wife, don't cut it off. So again, he says, but you shall not cut off your kindness uh, from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan uh, and David, they reconfirmed a covenant. They reconfirmed the covenant. They did the same things again to reconfirm it with the house of, uh, of David, saying, let the Lord require it at your hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him as he loved his own to vow that he would take care of his family. Where there's a great story, David, Saul and David, uh, Saul and Jonathan die. And if we go over to 2 Samuel, there's a great story that will teach us a lot about covenant. Uh, chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, verse 1, it says, It happened that in the spring of that year, uh, wait, I, no, I'm in the wrong chapter. I need to be in chapter 9. I'm sorry, chapter 9, I'm sorry. Verse, nine, uh, verse 1, now David said, Is there any who are left of the house of Saul, that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, here's what happened. Jonathan and Saul died in 1 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, David begins to consolidate the kingdom. He's well on his way to putting all of the pieces back together that were broken. And so he now takes a break and he says, is there anybody left of the house of Saul? Because I promised my covenant partner that I would take care of him. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, Yes, at your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of, of Jonathan who is lame at his feet. So this king said to him, Where is he? Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. The king sent and brought him out of the house of Machar, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. Now, I want, I want you to get this straight in your head. Saul's house was an enemy. Even though David married Saul's daughter, Saul was demonized to want to kill David and eradicate him from the earth because he felt he was a threat to the throne. And so Saul turned the whole army to find David. You can read it in 1 Samuel. So Jonathan and David made this covenant. So when Saul was died and Jonathan died in battle, they thought, because the common thing to do back then was to go in and kill whoever's going to take the throne to kill the family offspring of the king. Remember when they took over uh, Russia the, of the Tsar, they killed uh, all of the Tsar's family. That was very standard. So the housekeepers of Saul's family took the oldest son, Jonathan, who would be king's oldest son, Mephibosheth is his name. And while they're running, and this is in 2 Samuel, I believe chapter 4, they fall and they break both of his legs. They take him to a place called Lodabar. In the United States, that would be like Wyoming or Montana, to a very, very, uh, um, you know, uh, not, uh, sparsely populated area uh, where it was like in the wilderness, out of the way. So this young boy was raised by the servants of Saul, 
who probably fed him evil about David. If David finds you, he's going to kill you. Uh, he, he can't allow you to live. And he just, you know, your father hated him. He took your father's throne. It's supposed to be your throne. So this kid grew up probably very bitter at David with the wrong thinking process of David and really didn't understand David and Jonathan's relationship. So it was very distorted. So verse 6, 2 Samuel 9, 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face, prostrated himself. Then David said to Mephibosheth, and he answered, he said, here's your servant. David said to him, do not fear. What does he think? He's going to take his head off. David says, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I'll restore to you all the lands of Saul, your grandfather, but you shall eat bread at my table continually. Well, who, who eats at David's table? The princes of the land. So David's actually making him like one of his sons. Then he bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such as a dead dog? In other words, why are you making such a big thing of me? I'm like a dog in your sight. The king called Ziba, Saul's servant, said to him, I have given your master's son all that belongs to Saul and to his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him. You shall bring the harvest that your master may have food to eat. Literally, have money, cash, right, from the, from the output of the land. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. You know, then Ziba said to the king, according to all that the king has commanded your servant, so you will do. But as for Mephibosheth, uh, he shall eat at your table. Now, I w this is sort of a great story for us to understand because we grow up with a distorted view of God. Mephibosheth thought David was going to kill him, that he was going to judge him, that he was going to destroy him, that, that he had to. But what happened? He ended up becoming living like a prince, living in the king's house, living in royalty, living essentially above the law as one of the king's sons. He had, you know, all of his old estate given to him. His, his father was king, his grandfather was king, so he had estates and vineyards, and all of that was given to him. He ordered a large family to take care of that business for him and bring him the profits. And so this is a type of us. We grew up with a distorted view. We think God wants to judge us, wants to kill us, wants to hurt us, wants to break us. And we, we have to break that thinking And because I'm sure Mephibosheth the first night slept with one eye open saying, this is a big joke. I can't believe it's this easy. I can't believe I'm getting this mercy and grace. Uh, you know, and so it's a story to tell us and show us how this works. You know, why was it was nothing that Mephibosheth did to earn the position and blessings he had. It was all in his father Jonathan's covenant with David. Everything that we have is in covenant with Jesus. It wasn't us. We didn't do it. We're like Mephibosheth. There's nothing we bring to the table but faith in the agreement, faith in the gospel, faith in Jesus and what he represents. And so when you see in him, by him, with him, through him, we see these are covenant terminology. Everything after it ties it to this agreement. And so we see that, you know, all of these blessings are given to us, not because of us. And that's what Paul's trying to tell the Galatian church. <coughs> He's trying to tell them, guys, all of this is yours, not because of you. You couldn't earn it in the first place. You just have to have faith in it. So let's finish up the last uh, 10 verses of the chapter. Verse 19, wherefore then serve the law. It was added because of transgression till the seed should come. Let me amplify it out. It was added because of sin till Jesus should come whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. The mediator is the advocate that goes out to make the covenant. So he's saying the mediator is God. God's the covenant mediator. Jesus is the son of God, is the mediator. 
Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. If there had not been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness would have come by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Here's why the law, the law can never make us righteous because it couldn't satisfy the requirements of God to make us righteous. So the law and promise together said there's going to be a solution to it. Believe the solution. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that no one was good enough. That the promise by faith of Jesus might be given to them that believe. But before faith come, they were kept under the law, shut up under faith, which should come afterwards to be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith is come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, for we're all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, by faith in covenant with Jesus Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, there is all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. And so we, we see this, we see... You know, this, and there's a lot today. I can teach a whole series on this chapter. I mean, for instance, why, this is why Jesus had to be born of a virgin. He had to be born of a virgin because the unrighteous seed traveled from the male. Uh, you know, Corinthians uh, uh, tells us that, that sin passed upon all men. And so it was the male seed. Abraham, uh, Adam had the commandment before Eve was even created. And so unrighteousness traveled through the male seed. So to be born outside of the unrighteousness of man, holy and righteous Jesus, Jesus was born of a virgin, inseminated by God, conceived by Mary. He grew up without the sin that Abraham had on humanity, but on the cross, he became our sin. So that was the cup. The cup was not uh, the beatings that he took. Remember he said, if this cup can pass from me, the cup wasn't the beatings, the scourging, the plucking out of his beard, the whipping. It was separation from God. It was taking your sin, a righteous holy man that has only known righteousness and right standing with God, that eternally was connected with God, eternally lived, had to now suffer like he was spiritually dead by God taking our sins and putting them on him while he's on the cross, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, soulishly abused. And then he goes into the earth where all saints in the Old Testament went until God raised him from the dead on the third day. And so that's why he had to be born of a virgin and, you know, to be able to pay for our sins because he had to be a righteous, blameless holy lamb of God, and he was. He, there was no sin in him. And so we begin to learn all these pieces because we have to go deeper than a superficial knowledge to understand truly what belongs to us. So that's our episode from today. As I ask you always, please share. Please share this with family, friends. Intentionally share it. Share it and say, please listen to Sebastian. Go to the website and get the notes. They're on the front page of the website, line upon line. Sign up to be a free member and get access to all of our curriculum, all of our teachings, all of our, everything we have. And pray about uh, supporting us, donating to us. Make us one of the ministries you support. Give us $20, $30, $50 a month, you know, as, as people add up and we get partners every week, you know, we grow and we're able to hire staff and do other things. I, I have a lot of things I want to do. Our curriculums, look at them. They're well done. They're produced in a studio. Uh, 